so Lilith Yerzigarian, I hope I've pronounced it, um, Higi, Higi Zarian, I hope I've pronounced it for correctly. And if you could go to the next slide quickly, then I can make an announcement. So um, the two um, events happening today at the online Interpol, it's a career development event at 5 p.m. Central European time, the scientific writing seminar at 6 p.m. Central European time, the latter one is a live event. So I encourage um, everyone, especially early career researchers at Interpol to attend these two events. Now to our speaker, Lilit is an associate professor at um, Cincinnati University. She has two affiliations there. She's working at the Department of Biomedical, Chemical, Environmental Engineering, but she's also affiliated with the Department of Civil and Environmental Engineering at the University of Cincinnati. Lilit has a PhD um, from Cornell University, a master's from the American University of Romania, and a bachelor's degree from the Yerevan Polytechnic Institute in Yerevan in Armenia. Before she joined the University of Cincinnati, she held um, various research positions at the University of California in Los Angeles. Very wide ranging, um, a wide range of departments from the Department of Biostatistics to the Department of Epidemiology and the Department of Bioengineering. Lilith has a wide range of research interests from multifunctional advanced materials, environmental sensing, to porous media, to watershed processes and environmental sustainability. And her invited lecture today is um, on the, probably more on the latter topic. Um, the title of her talk is Hydrogrid, Emerging Technologies for Global Water Quality and Sustainability. Before I hand over to Lilith, and please remind, um, allow me to remind you that um, your cameras and microphones should be muted. If you do have a question and you're using the live Zoom app, please do raise your hand. Otherwise, if you're um, connecting through Rover, please type your questions in the session, um, question answer session. I will monitor your questions and pass them on to Lilith after the talk. Um, and of course, recording of the event of this presentation is not allowed. So. Without further ado, I put myself on mute now and hand over to Lilith. The floor is all yours. Sebastian, thank you very much for this introduction. Um, I'm delighted to be here. I'm going to start sharing my screen so you can see my slides. Um, there you go. Um, I would like to give you an overview of our work on emerging technologies for water uh, global water quality and sustainability. And I'll start with human migration. Um, human history is a history of migration. And migration has been our simplest answer to crisis when the land stopped bearing fruit, when wells dried up, when it got too crowded and in the times of war, we simply picked our earthly possessions and we moved to new untapped lands and rivers. The planet seemed infinite. We planted endless fields of grain. We used water to irrigate them. We built one dam after another, and one power plant after another to power our growing factories and homes. And we disposed of our waste into the vast oceans. As the human race continued to prosper, grow, and spread, we have run out of new land and water to escape to. And as we have grown, so has our collective impact on the planet's natural resources. And what we do on one side of the planet is going to be felt on the other. The planet stopped being infinite. So what we have now is aging and damaged infrastructure and the trinity of water problems. Too much, not enough, and dirty. And we're finally coming to realize that we must learn how to sustainably manage what we have. And what we have is one land and one water. So how do we start thinking about one water? Well, I propose the concept of the hydrogrid as a framework to help us navigate this highly complex problem. The hydrogrid encompasses all water systems, surface and groundwater, natural environment, and built infrastructure. And for, the pre for this presentation, I will focus on microbial contamination of surface water due to its disproportionate impact on human health. However, the concept and technologies that I develop here can be expanded to other aspects of the hydrogrid. Now, to start using this concept of the hydrogrid to sustainably manage water resources, let us take a quick look at how another grid, the electrical grid, 
is managed. Both hydrogrid and electrical grid are transport networks. However, the electrical grid is an engineered product in its entirety, where electricity flows are monitored in real time using sensors and meters, and the structure is well known. Monitoring data are analyzed and interpreted with well-established physics-based mathematical models that generate predictions of the state of the grid in near future. And then these predictions are leveraged in control centers to co correctively control the flow of electricity and to prevent cascading failures. While the electrical grid is an engineering system, the hydrogrid is a hybrid. However, these three fundamental aspects of monitoring, analysis, and control apply equally to both networks. The hydrogrid, however, presents its unique challenges. When it comes to monitoring, the biggest challenge is lack of real-time data. With regards to analysis, the challenges are even more complex. The processes are not fully understood, and there is uncertainty and variability in flows on contaminant transport. And finally, there is no developed control theory. So all decisions and policies must be made under conditions of uncertainty. I'm addressing these challenges by working on all three aspects of the hydrogrid, monitoring, analysis, and control. I will start with real-time environmental monitoring for microbial water contamination. We are working on mobile autonomous devices that could be deployed in water, detect microbes, and transmit information. I will also talk about materials that we have developed for the sensors. The information from the sensors could provide continuous data that we use to power multi-scale stochastic models of contaminant dynamics. And the ultimate output is a set of process-based sustainability metrics that describe water quality status. Information from the analytical models is then used to study how to control surface water networks. And in turn, this information is used for decision making in water quality mitigation. We are lacking real time water quality data, and that is particularly true about microbial presence in water. And this is because microbial field data are very expensive and difficult to collect. So one way to solve this problem and produce high resolution data is to have cheap and reliable autonomous mo mobile biosensors that could be deployed in lakes and rivers and that would stream information about microbes to us in real time. And this is how we envision this device. And notice this undulating um, traveling wave on the surface. Many microorganisms swim using this particular mechanism. Here is the prototype of this device. And in the next couple of minutes, I'm going to talk about the materials that we use, the propulsion mechanism, the cargo transport capability, sensing and research to develop new materials for these sensors. Now, the material that we use is a polymer hydrogel that consists of highly porous polymer network that holds a large amount of water, about 95% or more by volume. Now, this particular hydrogel belongs to the class of smart materials that can respond to environmental change. And it has a very interesting property. It can change its volume dramatically in response to changes in temperature. And it is called a volume phase transition. The critical temperature for this gel is 33 degrees centigrade. And below it, the polymer network holds water. But once it's heated above the critical temperature, the water is expelled and the gel collapses. And we harvest this volume phase transition property to make them move like a worm in its burrow. And the schematic that you see here shows what happens when a cylindrical hydrogel is enclosed in a glass tube with heating and cooling thermoelectrical devices attached to the tube. As the elements are heated, the gel starts shrinking to the left, from the left, the center of mass moves to the right. As we continue heating up the gel from the left, it continues shrinking until, until it is fully collapsed. And then we start cooling the gel down from the same side. The gel expands to the right as, as we cool it. And eventually, this result in longitudinal displacement in the tube. It's really very much like a warm movement. The moving gel can also transport cargo. And here we have a swollen gel in a tube. You don't see it yet because it is fully uh, swollen. 
The cargo here is a small little bead attached and I'm going to run the video that shows what happens when we start heating up the gel from left to right. Now, in the future, we will tackle the energy sources and the radio transmissive capabilities of this system. The next step was to take the gel out of the tube and have it swim in an open aquatic environment. And this time, the phase transitions are propagated using a laser, so the gel is really remotely controlled. And the sequence of photographs that you see here is a gel controlled by a laser that hits it up from the left. The red dots show the original location of the gel. And you see that as we propagate the transitions from left to right, the gel slowly moves out and the final displacement is about seven millimeters. To give the gel biosensing capabilities, we conjugated antibodies to the surface of the gel so that it could capture fluorescently labeled E. coli in the solution. And the micrograph on the right shows this E. coli captured on the surface of the gel. In the future, we will work several on several items. One is the energy source for autonomous propulsion, and the second is the ability to climb contamination gradients towards the contaminant source. Now, the choice of material for the sensor is critical. For example, the standard hydrogels, um, the phase transitions are too slow, and the graphs on the left show changes in length of a hydrogel with time during three cycles of shrinking and swelling. And just one cycle takes over 16 hours to complete. It will be a very slow device. Now, on the other hand, the hybrid hydrogels that are synthesized using laponite clay um, as a crosslinker are superior in terms of swelling and shrinking kinetics. And so the hybrids complete a cycle under an hour. So we have two orders of magnitude difference to complete a full cycle and much faster kinetics. Now, one of the reasons for such dramatic difference in kinetics is the poor connectivity within the material. And that one is determined by structure of the porous space within the gel. On the left, you see an SEM image of a standard hydrogel with weak cross-linking and poor, poor connectivity. And on the right is a nanocomposite hybrid gel with laponite, which high, with high pore density and very well connected pores. Now the structure and connectivity of the pore space determines the movement of water through the polymer network during phase transitions and therefore the speed of the device. This in essence is the problem of flow in porous media and that is not a new problem. Soil physicists have been working on this for decades but standard methods used in soils do not work here mostly because unlike soils the material is highly porous 95 percent or higher. So the structure of the void space cannot be described easily. To characterize the void space and to simulate flow in highly porous materials, we have developed the pore topology method. We have adopted a computationally efficient and fast algorithm from biomedical image processing to extract the medial surface of the void space, which is a three-dimensional surface that runs exactly midway between solid clusters. You can see the medial surface of this very simple pore space, the prism, and on the bottom left, you see an image of a virtual 80% porous material and its medial surface. Now, the medial surface plays three roles. It characterizes the void space. It contains all information for accurate material reconstruction and serves as a solution domain for flow simulation. Now, the pore space connectivity is characterized by permeability. We computed the permeability of the structure and compared it to computationally expensive direct numerical simulation techniques. In contrast, our methods are very fast, but are also very accurate. Um, furthermore, we use pore topology method in, mater in virtual material design. And what we see here is software called PTM design, where we generate virtual materials with designed porosity, pore distribution, and permeability. So let's say we want to generate a material with 50% porosity. We create the domain. We introduce random seeds. We generate the Poisson field. We cut it.
and we have the final design. We can design for pore size distribution. It only takes eight iterations. And we can design for permeability. Now, moving to analysis, we start with models of microscopic microbial dynamics. We then scale them up uh, to describe behavior of large numbers of microbes within entire watersheds. And the goal is to yield sustainability metrics for microbial water quality that are deeply rooted in our fundamental understanding of physics that govern microbial dynamics on a microscopic scale. And because the problem of microbial water contamination is multi-scale, the analysis requires multi-scale data from many sources. We use data from field and laboratory studies, geospatial data, hydrogeochemical data, as well as data reflecting how humans have modified the landscape and vegetation. We have developed a stochastic Markov model that describes the behavior of individual microbes in time and space. And the cartoon here shows the microbes on soil surface and in water during rainfall and runoff events. The brown circles are viable microbes and the red ones are non-viable. They can be free or attached to soil particles. And we define five microbial states that reflect whether they're in water or on soil surface, attached to soil particles or not. And these states form a stochastic Markov process that governs microbial transport in time and in space. We solved these model equations and projected the microorganism states over the entire watershed. This is one uh, agricultural watershed near uh, Cincinnati. And we focus on this subcatchment that I show here. To analyze it, we use GIS and uh, that allows to represent surface flows as a schematic Lincoln node network that you see on the left. We expand GIS to handle the math computations for the Markov processes, and we also couple an erosion model. And um, from model solutions, we can compute several sustainability metrics like reliability, vulnerability, and resilience. And here on the map, we show the spatial distribution of the composite sustainability index. Red means low sustainability and green means high. And we see here the, that first order streams are red. So the recommendation for miti mitigation is that it should be implemented in first order streams. Now that we've discussed the technologies to monitor the watersheds and analytical methods to describe the state of surface water, we can move on to developing capabilities to control that state. Now we define the state of water as its microbial level or value of sustainability metrics uh, that we're interested in. And really, if you think about it, controllability is a function of governing equations and the water network structure. So what we're dealing here is controllability of processes on networks. Traditionally, governing equations have been addressed in control theory, while the network structure is the purview of graph theory. So, to control water quality or sustainability, we must marry control theory and graph theory. Here is an example of controllability analysis for the Wax Lake data in Louisiana, United States. The delta has a total of 55 nodes, contains 24 outlets. The first graph shows how much control each node possesses. The delta inlet has the highest control and the outlets have the lowest. Now, moving on to the right, to control all nodes in this delta, we need to control 24 nodes that are marked in red and they're called the driver nodes. In the middle, you see what to do if we want to control a targeted set of nodes. And to control all of the delta outlets, we need to control these 15 driver nodes in the middle. And the last graph shows the driver nodes that are needed to control a randomly selected set of 24 nodes. There are two items left to address. 
how to produce short and long-term forecasts of sustainability metrics, and how to make these capabilities available to decision makers, such as watershed managers, EPA, Center for Disease Control, and eventually the general public. I envision that these decision-making tools will become available to users as a web service. The data from different sources and scales would be streamed to a cloud where the analytical models will also reside. Users with access to internet send a request for forecast for water contamination and sustainability metrics at the specific location and receive risk of um, or sustainability maps. Now, there has been an important development recently to enable this capability, and that is called the National Water Model that was developed by the NOAA in cooperation with multiple partners. And what it does is produces flow forecasts on 250 and one kilometer grid over almost 3 million river reaches across continental US. The forecasts are short range, medium range, and long range. And the hydrogrid is using these flow predictions for water quality and sustainability forecasts. And here is a prototype of this service. Here is a map of a watershed near Cincinnati. And what we're looking at is the probability of exceeding safety limits for dissolved nitrogen in water. Green indicates low probability of contamination, yellow mid-range, and red elevated probabilities. So the streams shown here in circles have a high probability of contamination. And let's say we want to predict what is the impact of in implementing various mitigation strategies to reduce nitrogen loading into streams. And the one we simulate here is planting grass strips throughout the entire watershed. Now this map shows the change in associated probability of contamination. Light color means less change, and darker color means more change. And interestingly, we see that installing grass strips did not really make a significant impact on the areas that were at high risk. So our recommendation for this particular strategy will not work well in this watershed. Now, we have just scratched the surface of this concept of the hydrogrid, and there is a lot more to it. It is not isolated from the power grid, from agriculture and food supply. It is tightly linked to public health, ecosystem health, and services. And I do look forward to expanding our capabilities to cover all of these connected areas. And with that, I would like to conclude my talk. I thank you all very much for your attention, and I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you very much, Lilith, for a really inspiring, visionary talk. Um, I see, and I need to switch, toggle back and forward between the over session. If you do have questions, please do rise. If you're using the Zoom app, please do raise your hand. We can answer, um, you, can, you can ask the question directly through Zoom. Otherwise, please do enter your questions in the over app. And the first question that um, has been asked, I think it's from Majid Tazanizade, is you showed um, that the jail is moving and when it is hit by a laser in one of your videos, it looks like the jail is only contracts and then its length becomes smaller. The tail moves forward, but the head doesn't. Is that observation correct? Um, to some degree, and that depends on the type of material that is used. Um, also, uh, so let me describe how it works. Um, what we do is integrate within the material of the gel a dye that is responsive to heat by the laser. And that one is not a very efficient process. So what happens is that the contraction takes place slowly. So you have to wait a long time before the entire gel expands. And that long time takes um, hours. So what you saw there is a snapshot of a process where you see some contraction and then the gel starts expanding to the right and move to the right. Um, and we captured basically a part of the entire process. Now, another aspect that we noticed is that um, after multiple cycles of contracting and expanding, the gel stops uh, assuming the same full size. 
And we're still working to understand what is happening. Is there a change in the physical structure of the polymer network so that it becomes permanently constricted? Or is it just a matter of equilibrating the gel that takes longer that we expend, uh, that, than we expanded, expected? <laughs> Thank you. Um, and there's a follow-up question from Majit. He asks, is it really feasible to work with immediate surface in three dimensions? He has found many issues with it in real 3D and um, the examples that you show on slide 20 in the top left corner is not a real, is not really 3D as the pore walls are all vertical. So what is your experience in using the uh, immediate surfaces? I don't think we have experience explored really all the capabilities of using the medial surfaces. So currently, um, we know that we can reconstruct the entire structure from the medial surface. But I don't think that we use all the information that um, is contained in there. So um, I think that currently what, what we have is basically collapsing a three-dimensional structure or information that we have from a three-dimensional structure into really 2D. And then we work on this 2D as a solution domain. Um, I agree with you, Majid, that it's, it's not over yet. So we, we are continuing to see how we can relax some of the assumptions that we use um, in working with the medial surface and really understand all the, um, the capabilities that it affords us. So I would be actually very happy to take a look at, um, to, have, to have this conversation with you and see what you have found uh, with the 3D representation of materials. We do have a question from Monica Vasilio Hazas, and she asks, um, within HydroGrid, what is the relation between the gel and the monitoring of the watershed? Uh, the gel is the uh, vision of where we're going. The problem with, in particular with water quality is that in order to collect information, um, you need to send a student. Uh, the student takes water in the bucket, brings it to the lab, and 36 to 48 hours later, we know whether there was a microbial contamination there or not. So real time or even near real time um, understanding of water quality in terms of microbial contaminants is currently impossible. So the idea is that we need to de develop and deploy multiple sensors that can actually produce this real-time microbial water quality information. And when we do that, what we can do is actually characterize and understand in real time what happens with the water. Until we have that information, we cannot really understand what is going on in the watersheds. They're highly complex and we don't even have data. So I'm looking at the development of these mobile cheap devices, sensors that can be used in the environment as the future of microbial uh, monitoring in surface water. Thank you. And since in, at the moment there are no questions coming up in the chat, there's something that I'm itching to ask myself. I think I'm really intrigued by the sensor technology, and I think this is where a lot of the future is going and connecting it up to the Internet of Things. And we see this happening on the energy demand management side a lot. And the question I have is, do you think these sensors can be produced cheaply enough so that you could deploy them in developing countries where there's water contamination is a much bigger issue compared to what we see in Europe and North America. So what's the timeline until these tools could become available? Because it's such an urgent need. You're absolutely correct. And that is something that um, we have been thinking about also, because here in, in the States, at least, at least there is regulation of some of some sort, so you can, you can monitor the water more or less. But um, in the rest of the world, it is a problem that leads to severe public health issues. Um, I think that they can be monet uh, they can be produced inexpensively. All the materials that we use are cheap. Um, I would give the timeline of ten years to full development, five to ten years of full development um, past the beta version. Uh, the beta version, I would say, five years to actually get them to 
be autonomous, move autonomously, and to connect to the Internet of Things, because that would be the only way that we can receive information um, from these sensors. We do not have hopes of collecting them uh, after mm -hmm. deployment, right? Um, so the materials that we use are environmentally, environmentally friendly. Uh, they, um, they will disappear in the environment, or one, as one of my colleagues says, fish probably will eat your sensors. <laughs> Um, but yeah, it, it is five to 10 years from uh, beta in five and full deployment in 10. I hope we're, faster. We need to make sure we invite you back for another keynote lecture in five to 10 years. Oh, I um, hope sooner. <laughs> so unfortunately, this already um, concludes our time for this um, invited lecture. So thank you very much um, again, Lilith on behalf of all the attendees um, who apparently, uh, unfortunately can't so con um, give a round of applause. So thank you very much on behalf of all the attendees and Interpol for this excellent, inspiring talk. And I don't know if Christy still wants to mention something or needs to mention something before we close that session. Um, no, I, I don't have anything more to add. You guys have covered it all. <laughs> Good. And I hope everyone has an enjoyable rest of the concert conference, online conference, and looking forward to many more exciting talks like this one today for the rest of the conference. Thank you.